Welcome to Persons of Interest. I am your host, Derek Dockett. Every day, people look to meteorologists for weather forecasts. They inform us of temperatures, precipitation, severe weather, and so much more. In this episode, I had a great conversation with Chester Lampkin, who's currently a meteorologist at WUSA in Washington, D.C. He previously worked right here in St. Louis, Missouri, but also in New Zealand, Grand Junction, Colorado, Jefferson City, Missouri, and El Paso, Texas. Chester and I discussed a wide range of things related to his career, including when he first took an interest in weather, his process of working towards his college degrees, severe weather, and how technology and social media have also shaped his role. This is Chester Lampkin on Persons of Interest. Well, ladies and gentlemen, another episode of Persons of Interest, and I am very, very excited to talk to this gentleman because I followed him on Twitter for a while um, back when he was uh, doing weather in St. Louis, and then he was doing weather in New Zealand, then he was doing weather in St. Louis, and now he's doing weather in our nation's capital in Washington, D.C. I am talking about Mr. Chester, Chester Lampkin. I think thank you so much for taking time to hop on the podcast to talk with me, sir. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Well, we talked before we started recording that this thing is usually about people's career paths and how they got to where they were. But I want to deep dive because I know you're a Mizzou guy. I know mm-hmm. you are uh, a, a local group in, in this area, but now you're doing your thing in D.C. But uh, I guess share the folks that may not know you, um, your background, you know, St. Louis, Mizzou, and how you took an interest into uh, uh, jumping into the wonderful world of weather. Well, okay. So, um, first things first, I'm a, I'm a hybrid. I'm not just a Mizzou guy. I was oh, a, okay. a SLU guy first. That's actually where I got my degree in meteorology. So okay. University. Yeah. So, um, Mizzou was grad school. Um, and, uh, you know, that's a complicated story, but basically <laughs> the alumni association sends me stuff and I, and I still owe them a thesis. So, you know, that's a work in progress here, but, uh, I think that may happen later this year, but uh, well, we'll go back to the beginning. Um, so I'm, I'm a St. Louis native, born and raised. I grew up in uh, North St. Louis City, um, not far from uh, Pine Lawn. In fact, it's really interesting because Pine Lawn is right in St. Louis County for those familiar with the St. Louis mm-hmm. divisions. And um, I lived a couple doors down into the city and I had neighbors that went to high school in Normandy, but I lived in the city. So uh, I was able to participate in the DSEG program or the segregation program. Um, and uh, though it still kind of exists to, to this day, it's not nearly what it was when I was uh, right. a child in the 80s and 90s. Uh, but I ended up going to high school out in Chesterfield. So I kind of got a little bit of everything growing up in the city, going to school in the suburbs and uh, eventually going to college in the city again. Um, but, what high school? Got to ask that. That's same. Yeah, of course, of course. You know, it's an STL question. Uh, I'm a I'm a Colt Parkway Central. So how about that? Yeah, representing the Colts. So I don't know if you you know this from our Twitter back and forth. I went through the same program, the yep. voluntary desegregation program. Lived in the city. I lived mm-hmm. right near the Riverview Circle. Oh and, yeah, not far from where I grew up. Okay. Yes, yes. Um, and I attended Parkway West. Ah, <laughs> yeah. There you go. There's nothing wrong with that. There you go. So I had to yeah. throw that in there. I'll yeah. let you continue with your story though, because no, we you're were all good. technically high school to rivals. So, yeah, yeah, just yeah. My sister went to West. Actually, that's where she graduated from. So nice, it's interesting. Um, but yeah, so I, um, you know, I did. Um, I grew up throughout the entire my entire schooling was K through. 12th grade, like the entire schooling was in Parkway. Um, so that was a unique experience um, growing up in St. Louis City, but attending this school out in the suburbs where, you know, arguably they had uh, just a lot more resources in the city school. So um, that's kind of shaped my worldview a little bit. Um, very proud to have gone to Parkway, of course, um, but I represent my college even more, uh, you know, being a true Billiken. Uh, so I even went to a Billikens game here in DC. They played George Mason. <laughs> there you go. Um, back in, I think it was February, or right at the very beginning of March. It was like right around that time. Same conference, A10. So, yep. yeah. Um, and uh, went to grad school at the University of Missouri. So I am a Tiger as well. And uh, I love Mizzou. Like 
you know, even though it was grad school for me, I loved it. Um, still love the school. It's very, it was a, also a unique experience, but, um, you know, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. So I did, I did, um, I actually, it's, I am one of those kids that like wanted to be a meteorologist growing up. Like I, I was a weather nerd, if you will, whether I had a meteorologist friend in El Paso. I used to work there too in El Paso, Texas. He, okay. We called them weather weenies. Um, but yeah, weather nerd, weather weenie, weather, whatever you want, enthusiast. Um, yeah, I still get sometimes, uh, still sometimes get chided by my partner. <laughs> she sometimes is like, get off your phone. I'm like, I'm looking at the radar, you know, like <laughs> on my day off. But like, I just love weather. I'm yeah. a meteorologist, so. She just rolled her eyes at me. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that's you know that's that's who I am. Um, but yeah, I was as a kid, I grew up in St. Louis, so this the storms, you know, Derek is just we get beastly storms in yeah. St. Louis. Um, you know, I don't remember it because I was such a young kid, but like I was around for the blizzard of '82, quote unquote blizzard of '82. Um, so like I was there's a picture of me in the snow as a as a little toddler in that snowstorm so my history is goes from there to like the worst of severe thunderstorms you know there was always really just nasty weather in st louis and that the summers were hot and humid and i grew up in old brick house north city so you oh, know yeah. those house guys didn't have central air right. so they had to suffer <laughs> through those hot summers and then in the winter it just bone chilling cold i remember the late uh 80s where we had some uh some mornings where I had to go out to the bus stop and it was, you know, below zero waiting on that, that bus uh, to take me out to Parkway. So yeah, it, you know, I'm a child of the, the Midwest weather and specifically St. Louis. So that's how I became interested in this. Um, but you know, it wasn't a linear path. It certainly, there's a lot of turns in there. It's not just straightforward. Do you figure out that, so obviously with, with meteorology, that's a, there's a science part in there, of right. course. And at what point, part of education did you figure out man this is what I like it, it was it just el- early in elementary was it high school that it really developed and you honed in on it yeah at what point because I can tell you for me man I am not a science guy like I like history right. but man even history to a certain extent I just never was a great test taker but I loved art and that's how I got into graphic design and doing design work mm-hmm. and then that sort of mm-hmm. emerged a marketing thing for me was it always yeah. science for you at, at, you know, elementary or high school? It, it was, um, mostly. Um, I've always been kind of interested in earth science. So in addition to really liking the weather as a kid, I was always into, I was somewhat into like the geosciences too. So okay. I was interested in, just as a kid, as volcanoes and earthquakes. I look at maps of fault lines and look at where, volcanoes erupted and you know the ring of fire you learn about and in, in as a kid like th- that circles the pacific ocean just like fascinated me um i always thought that was very interesting so like all that earth sciencey type stuff um specifically meteorology was one and then the other one would be uh sort of some of the geology stuff um and then i really like geography too uh, i distinctly remember winning the geography be in eighth grade i don't think i got anything <laughs> from it but like uh, maybe a certificate or something and i just was a, a map nerd too like i really uh there was a time i can't now but i could i i still can freehand the united states i'm sure and name all the states with these but there was a time i knew where all the capitals were and yeah. probably could even draw some of the interstate highways and mountain ranges and stuff like that so i've always been kind of like a a geography uh i guess nerd in that sense and that's what my master's program uh was a geography program so um yeah i'm i've always been in that kind of that realm um anything to do with maps really uh i really really like it and um you mentioned history uh a lot of people don't know this i actually have a bachelor's in history too how about that yeah and that comes from you know i had i like to call it a quarter life crisis borrowing a line from a john Mayer song <laughs> If anyone knows that song, he says, there's, there's a song where he says there might be a quarter life crisis. It's kind of ridiculous to have a quarter life crisis, but I did in college anyway. Hopefully it's a quarter life, quarter of my life. <laughs> uh, but when I, you know, I went to, you know, Parkway and, um, you know, that get, got me a good education so I could uh, get into the 
you know, most of the schools of my choices and, and SLU and Mizzou were the two main ones. And I uh, got into St. Louis University. So um, having lived in the city, growing up in the city, uh, it was right down the street. So I used to take the bus to school and the Metrolink and, yeah. um, you know, and then eventually I got a car and would drive, commute to school from North City. Sorry, I have an alarm going off here. Oh, you're um, I would eventually, you know, yeah, eventually I got a car, commute to, to campus North City. And, uh, you know, I immediately went in and declared meteorology as my major okay um but um i i i got schooled my my i would say my sophomore year is when it really got tough for me and you know, at slu um i did all right freshman year but i'd say chemistry which is not my favorite subject mm-hmm. and uh you know in meteorology you have to take a lot of advanced math yeah um, more than i expected and so that was that was kind of some, I had to deal with some adversity when it came to that. that I was going to say, ask you at some point, did you have anything that said, boy, I don't know if this is going to be for me. Like yeah. maybe it's time I say, what can I do with this? I still like this, but right. is there a different path? But obviously the adversity, you, you stuck with it. Yeah, battle through. I, I did. Um, but it, it took some work. So um, most television weather folks, meteorologists, they are, they they have bachelor's degrees in meteorology. Most of them do. Uh, some they have other degrees, and I'm certainly not diminishing those degrees. Sure. Uh, some of them are associates. Some of them are, you know, other like more like geography, but with an emphasis in atmospheric sciences. Some of those degrees will get you a job in TV weather, but they wouldn't get you a job, say, at the National Weather Service. Okay, you know, you have to have certain credentials. Um, so I went through a program where that's what, that's what you get trained to do. A lot of the folks that I went to school with, if they didn't go in the Air Force um, because of ROTC at SLU, they would go into National Weather Service or they go into academia and go on to get a master's or PhD and then teach or do research or work you know, for some other research corporation of some sort. So I have those credentials, and they're tough credentials to get. And so that's what the calculus was. It kind of kicked my butt. Um, Specifically, calculus two and calculus three both were classes I had to take over, uh, oh, especially wow. calc two. You had to take it more than once, and it, you know, calc two was was so interesting because it wasn't the fact that I didn't flunk it; I just couldn't get higher than a D. Like I just, you know, admittedly, I, I, I to get a to go on to the next class, you have to get a C, yeah. and I just had to retake that course. Um, it kicked my butt, um, and there was a there was a time. Where, where uh, there's one semester where I had to withdraw from the calculus course because I just knew I wasn't going to make it. Um, and then another semester where I finally was like, uh, this is, I don't know if I want to do this. And that's why that's where the history degree came in. I kind of escaped a little bit. I said, you know, I'm just going to go. I'm so close to getting a, a college degree. Maybe I'll just go get, declare a history major as well, bang out some courses and then maybe I'll, I wouldn't have wasted my time at St. Louis University. I was at a crisis of confidence, if, if you will, where I was like, maybe I won't do meteorology. Maybe I'll just go do something else. So, but um, I did it. I, you know, eventually I, I took the history courses. And then one semester, I finally was like, okay, this is the time. You know, this is just a, a matter of just two semesters. But that after a semester of taking away from the, the math course, having given up on that, I went back and doubled down and finally passed calculus two and three and got to, I had to take one more course, two more courses after that, um, in math. That's just the math. Yeah. (laughs) You know, I passed the chemistry and I did well in the physics and then there's the meteorology courses themselves. You actually, then you have to take the physics of the atmosphere. So, you know, there's all these things that come together. (laughs) And they, they kicked my butt, but eventually I got there um, while I was also doing the history courses. So I eventually there was a point where I realized I was taking all these high-level history courses and high-level meteorology courses at the same time. And I always I like to tell people this story, this story. Hopefully they haven't heard it too much from me, people who know me. But like I'd be my meteorology courses and people in there would be like, oh, I'm so glad I don't have to write papers anymore because we're doing all these equations and studying sure. the atmosphere. And then on the other side, the history 
people would be like, I'm so glad I don't have to do math anymore. <laughs> I just figured because, you were going there. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm doing both. And I'm in the three, 400 level. These are high level courses, you know, uh, in both, both majors. Yeah. Uh, but it, it worked out. I, you know, I got both degrees. Uh, I had so many credits because I had, I've been at school for so long that yeah. it, it gave me two degrees. I actually have two physical degrees, not a double degree. But two, two bachelor's degrees. degrees. Yeah. yeah. So That's figured. awesome. So yeah. you said a little bit earlier ago that you really enjoyed your time at Mizzou. I, did. I guess you, you would clarify, you would classify that as probably your, in, in terms of education, your favorite time. Like for me, I love college. I love yeah. my time at college. Same. I look back on it now. And I think that's one of the things why I find myself so much involved where I went to school at Missouri state. Mm-hmm. It was Southwest at the time. Right. I remember. Yeah. And now I'm involved as part of the alumni association, partly because I felt that I didn't sort of apply and not say apply myself, but outside of the classroom, I didn't take advantage of everything else there. Right. I granted, college is totally different now, but it's my thing of, man, I want to give back now because I really enjoyed my time here and I want to be involved mm-hmm. because I mm-hmm. wasn't as involved uh, when I was in college. So I take the time sure. to go back and, you know, speak, do some guest speaking things, things like that. Um, your time in Mizzou, same thing. You, is there something that you look back on that is meant, that is like, man, this is a, my fondest memory of before I, you know, had to jump into the real world. I, I, I loved going to sporting events or I love yeah. this teacher mm-hmm. or is there, is there something you look back on your time at Mizzou or SLU um, that was, that was you know, really hits home as a, a great memory for you? Yeah, I would say that most of my friends today, you know, I have, I've met a lot of people working in media, but a lot of my friends, my good friends today were actually from my undergraduate days at, okay. at St. Louis University. And we did, you know, I was involved in campus things. I also worked part-time while, while I was at school. So, you know, I had to juggle all that, but, you know, I was in some uh, organizations. Uh, I did uh, my mom from the Philippines. So I did Filipino student association and then I did the black student Alliance. So I did, I kind of did those things. So I have friends from those times. And then I lived on campus for a couple of years. I was a resident advisor. So I was, I was involved at St. Louis university. Um, basketball team wasn't that great time the baseball team, <laughs> team wasn't soccer team you know both men and women's teams were yeah. always pretty good especially the men's team um so you know i went to some sporting events uh so i have you know that section of my life is like there's yeah there's fond memories there and then for, for mizzou um i was very fortunate to be living in columbia missouri before i went to grad school there okay and i worked out in jeff city at the cbs affiliate there but i lived in columbia and uh, I had a lot of friends that were going to Mizzou at the time, um, you know, just in graduate programs. And what was really cool was that I was out there during the Chase Daniel days. Oh, okay. And so that's when I really got into college football. Okay. And I got to see some of the best of Mizzou's football. Yeah. So I lived out there for a while during that time, and I would go to games with friends. Um, it was a different phase of my life because I was an adult. I was working full sure. time and um, I was with graduate students. So it wasn't like that under classic undergrad experience, but you know, we still tailgated. We right, still right. would, you know, just cheer Not on the- that far removed from actually being a college student. Right. Exactly. I was just a few years older. Yeah. I was still in my twenties, but you know, just a few years later. And then uh, when I went, when I finally did go to graduate school there and I'm still friends with my, the folks I went to gra- grad school with, um, so, um, and I have friends in Colombia from having lived there for a few years. So, you know, again, I got to, again, experience the campus stuff, but I actually was, you know, an adult yeah. in a sense, you know, not like a fresh out of high school guy. So like, uh, it was a different perspective for me, but I got to do the sports st- sports things, but I got to take advantage of like their brand new, uh, I think they had just a few years prior, I, before I started grad school, they had just opened their, uh, their newer, um, man, what do they call that? It's not, there's a Memorial hall, which is, you know, the classic student union and okay. they have the newer student union, you know, so I got to take advantage of that because I was, you know, that happened when a lot of people I went to, who went to Mizzou from my high school days, they didn't have that Sure. big, that big, uh, beautiful building, you know, the campus was still blossoming at that time. And now it's, it's like totally transformed to like this little community. 
Um, so I got to take advantage of some of that stuff. And, and then James Franklin, I think, was the quarterback at the time of the Mizzou football team. And I remember walking to my grad building and I remember seeing him walk by on campus and I'd be like, oh, there's James Franklin. I'm like, oh, that's, that's kind of crazy, you know. To me, that's, that, that was kind of a big deal, you know. That yeah. We didn't have that at SLU, that experience, because we didn't have football. So I kind of right. got a little bit of both between the two universities by fond memories of, of both places. And, um, yeah, I'll, I'll forever have that, you know, which is really cool. So was it hard to get that first job? It was. Um, yeah, going back to that. Um, so I went, I was very fortunate that I got into uh, the media business before the Great Recession. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, that has, that shaped a lot of people's lives and trajectories and careers. So I was in, I've been in media now, you know, 15 years and um, I got in a few years before the recession and I applied to dozens of jobs. You know, it's hard. Getting that first job is really tough, especially in, in TV media, but it's probably true of like print and all, you know, all digital media today. Um, you just have to get someone who is willing to notice you among the, hundreds of I was gonna say style like, of college yeah graduates. so competitive right it's very competitive and you you end up in TV you end up in a small TV market I end up in Grand Junction Colorado which is way out in western Colorado it's hundreds of miles from any big city um big big beautiful place but like just very unique not terribly diverse either and so uh for a city boy like me it was very different uh but I got lucky and I got a job out there. And then uh, once I got in, you know, I just kept doing what I do. Learn to weather, forecast the weather, get better at it, and learn how to present the weather and get better at it. You just have to do that. In this case, especially in TV, you have to do it for years before you can even really move into a, a place like a St. Louis. You know, it could be, for some people, it could take 10 years to get to St. Louis. Yeah which is not even, you know, it's not even New York or Chicago. It's right. it's a big city, but it's not like New York, Chicago or LA. And St. Louis is one of those places where I feel most of our news anchors and television personalities tend to have a lot of tenure. They've been around mm -hmm. for a while. Right, so exactly. those opportunities tend to be rare. So when you right. see one pop up, it's like, oh my goodness, there's a job opening in my hometown. Yes. I've got to apply for this and right. fingers crossed that this goes my way. And right. I mean, you're one of many that are local St. Louis people mm -hmm. that have to take advantage of that. Because I'm thinking of like all the local folks that are St. Louis, you know, born, raised, and they're working in their hometown. And they talk about... You know, well, I was working in North Dakota, or I was working in mm -hmm. Minnesota first, or I worked here first. I worked in Arkansas, and then a job came open. Um, yeah. Was that difficult to to get that opportunity, and and was that process painful or nerve wracking or all of the above? Yeah, I think I think it is um, for the most part. I was very fortunate in that um, I knew somebody who worked at Channel Five before. I ended up working there, um, and that was um, Mike Roberts, who used to be an on-air meteorologist there for a long time. He also worked at Channel Four back in the '90s, uh, so he had, a, you know, he had—I wouldn't say he had pool, but he definitely knew who I was, sure. and I think that certainly helped me get on their radar. And and by then, I'd already been in the business for a few years, and I was the chief meteorologist at the CBS station in Jeff City. Okay. So I was in a higher ranking position, even though it was a small TV market, a higher ranking position. I had some experience um, and I wasn't afraid to, to be on camera in front of, you know, tens of thousands of people. Cause that's what happens in St. Louis. Like you've got tens of thousands of people watching you on any given newscast. Uh, St. Louis is, is a pretty loyal TV market to a lot of people watch there locally. You know, I truthfully, I can't say the same about DC. It's not the same here. But people do watch, but it's not like how St. Louis watches right. news. Um, so yeah, it was it was tough uh, for sure. And like, I don't think I don't think the opportunity would have been presented to me quite as easily if I if I didn't know if I hadn't known somebody already working at the at the TV station. Um, but I I feel like even despite that, at some point I probably could have ended up 
back in St. Louis. You know, it helps to be a St. Louis native. They like that in St. Louis. Sure. That's something that's yep. huge. And um, I knew I knew the market. I knew the geography. I knew the place. I've been to, you know, I know how to pronounce the road names. The, the strange <laughs> things about, you know, Very I know important. about this. Yeah, the city and county divide. I know about the Metro East. You know, I've been to to the places like Eckerd's and Belleville and, you know, to Ted Drew's in the city and to yeah. old historic St. Charles and, you know, I have friends who went to school and high school in Jefferson County, you know, things like that. Those little things I have, I, you know, I have a lot of family in St. Louis. So it, that's one of the things that is so great about St. Louis is that people, you know, when you know St. Louis, even if you're not from there, but if, once you really get to know it, if you live there for a while, you feel like you're really, you can be really connected to the community if you so choose. Yeah. It's funny you say that when you, you know, the roads, you know, you know, yeah. the St. Louis stuff mm -hmm. uh, and how that matters because, and I, I say that when social media and Twitter becomes part of, you know, what you do or in sports, right. cast, everyone sharing news, sharing information, right. which is one of the reasons how I'm, I'm, I, you know, you hop on Twitter, you, you use it to your advantage of how you want to get information. Sure. I follow several folks in our St. Louis media outlets, some from my previous job at Missouri Valley conference that I made connections mm -hmm. with and I still have connections with, but then it's like, Oh, well, I, this is the guy from TV and I'm going to follow him. And you sort of get this re, quote unquote relationship. Of, right. You trust them, but you, yeah. you trust what they do and what they say. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. part of what you guys do. Sort of same thing for me is why I've followed you for so long. And I say that because then when you take the job to New Zealand, it literally <laughs> was kind of like, wait a minute. Well, who am I going to get my weather for? Because there are other weather uh, personalities in the area and at that station that will take over the position, but you sort of grow to trust a particular right. person. And so when they go elsewhere, you're like, well, that's a bummer. But yeah, yeah, I, I, I look at it as, cause I know that's gotta be a career opportunity a, because mm -hmm. you obviously, obviously always want to grow in what you're doing, but B mm -hmm. um, from a weather standpoint, I'm thinking to myself going, you know, going well outside of the St. Louis bubble now to do something <laughs> totally different. So talk about yeah. an opportunity uh, in a unique area, unique climate. Um, what was that like in the decision to actually go there? Was that something that was tough or was that just kind of like, man, this is a great opportunity. I am taking advantage of it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would say more so the latter than the former. I mean, okay. it was a, a challenge for sure, but it was um, also exciting. Um, because, I mean, New Zealand kind of feels like one of those places that you just see almost like in a movie. You know? Yeah, like, like you, you never think the of going the there. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's like, oh, I, I, I'll put it on my bucket list of places to travel to. But, like, you don't really move there. But you'd be surprised. I mean, there are tens of thousands of Americans living down there really? in New Zealand. Wow. Yeah. And, in fact, um, I knew – I actually had a fellow Billiken uh, – guy who lived in the same dorm as me who lived in the same city as me when I lived wow. down in, in, uh, in Wellington, New Zealand, which is the capital of the country. So yeah, the opportunity came up. Um, I, you know, I just saw it on the job board. I didn't know anyone working at the New Zealand Met service where I ended up working. Um, I still did media and broadcast work, but it was, you know, not live television. So that was a change of pace, um, more projects than anything. Um, but, learning the geography of that place though. Well, you know, I knew that once, once I learned the geography of that place and how to pronounce certain things, uh, cause the Maori culture is the dominant native culture to that, to that place. So a lot of places are named in, in Maori, they're Polynesian people, you know, distant cousins of folks who live in Hawaii and Samoa and places like that. Um, I had to, that was something else I had to learn and how to respect their culture and be respectful of the Kiwi culture as a whole. Um, and to learn about rugby, which I didn't, <laughs> you know, which I love now, but like I didn't understand it at first. Uh, so like things like that. Um, yeah, that was a challenge. And of course, um, their weather maps are flipped. So that's different. You know, like it, the Southern Hemisphere, oh, where yeah. New Zealand is, yeah. the cold air comes from the South. Like yeah. when you think of, you get a southerly wind in St. Louis, you're going to get a warm day. Right. Uh, warmer than whatever it was previously. It's warm or hot, you know there that's a cold a southerly is a cold wind so like i had to learn about that i lived by the ocean i never lived on the coast before of any kind so yeah it was it was exciting but it was 
it was a challenge. It was all those things at once, but it was, it was some, something that I certainly would, would, would never hesitate to jump on something, learn something like that. And that's pretty much how I ended up in DC, kind of a similar okay. situation. You know, it's not quite the same, but like the excitement of living in the nation's capital, kind of in the belly of the beast where they do have exciting weather and nor'easters. They can get yeah. hit by hurricanes here and things like that. Um, not quite as humid as St. Louis, but pretty close. I was going to say, yeah, it, it can be. Oh, <laughs> it can, it I saw you sticky. tweet. I saw you tweet recently that you guys hadn't had a 90 degree day. We have not, like which is unusual. Yeah. Um, they, it's been an unusual winter here. We didn't have much winter. It was a warm winter and then spring has not been all that, I mean, it's warm, but it's not hot. So, it's, yeah. you know, and I'm learning, I'm learning some new things here too, because uh, we get, we get the Marine layer here, which is something we definitely would never get in St. Louis. That can really mess up your forecast. We have mountains here, which we don't have in St. Louis. Um, so yeah, otherwise we get the St. Louis weather. We get it a day later, basically. It's like the rule of thumb. Okay. DC. <laughs> Uh, so, but New Zealand was nothing like that. You know, yeah. I, I, I've worked in other places, Colorado, Texas, you know, where the weather was also completely different. So I've, I've gotten to experience a lot of very different things in my career, which is really cool. What's the one of all the places you've been, the one that's been sort of, I won't say difficult, but the one that's been the most unique to forecast. Mm. Cause I feel like St. Louis, after you've been here for a while, you get it, but we have these random days where it'll yeah. be cold, 65, yep. it'll get rain, and then at night it'll get cold again, and we'll get snow. Yeah. Like We've had those days where all four seasons happen in 24 hours, Yeah, and we yes. think that's unique, and sometimes we're not surprised when it happens, but I can yeah. think of, you know, being out west. I've been to Colorado Springs before and loved it, and yes. you know, they've had some beautiful weather, but I know nothing about New Zealand's weather, and right. <laughs> D.C. has a little bit of, you know, you can get... You, what you just said yeah any of those been more unique than the other i would say um well i haven't done the full year yet here in dc so may have to get back to me fully in about a year and i'll let you know but i i do think they have a real winter there too yeah and have a real winter which we have not they haven't had a nor'easter in years too so yeah. um, a big snow nor'easter they've had some nor'easters uh, but nothing that produced big snow um just supposed to rain but i would say midwest easily takes the cake as the most unique and difficult to, to predict. Um, Cause you're not just St. Louis, you know, I did, I've done five years total in St. Louis, but I also did um, a total of three years out in Columbia, Jeff city. So, you know, more than half my career I've been in the Midwest and um, those Jeff city in Columbia is just, you know, a couple hours from St. Louis. So it's basically the same weather. Right. Uh, those definitely would be the most difficult. Those, the Missouri Midwest, Missouri, Illinois, Midwest weather is the most interesting, challenging, and at times stressful weather to deal with. I would think that if I had now, if I had worked in Oklahoma or Texas, like Tornado Alley in Texas or Kansas, I'd probably be saying those places because those yeah. places are really they're notorious for just crazy weather. They get ice storms and then they'll get these crazy tornado, tornadic storms that, you know, killer storms. Um, so, yeah, I, uh, for now, you know, I mean, I don't plan on leaving DC anytime soon, but I, I'm going to go ahead and say that the most difficult was the St. Louis weather, uh, most interesting, difficult, um, and and at times stressful <laughs> weather. You know, so I've I've got to ask when you talk about the stress too part of it, mm -hmm. you're doing a job, you're doing yeah. a service. Yeah. And, and especially when it's severe weather. Right. That's when it really matters the most. Yes. You know? Yes. Yeah. Um, when do you ever feel the pressure to get it right? Yeah. All the time. Really? Yeah. I, um, I always, I always find it curious that, you know, you, you have science, you have technology now. I'm sure the advances of technology, like right. for me, using graphic design software has advanced and made things so much easier. Technology oh, sure. has to make things a little bit easier as, as you guys yes. radar advances and things like that. Mm -hmm. But does that lessen the pressure at all? Because so many people are watching and depending on what you say and they're trying to plan their day around, you know, what you say on TV. Mm -hmm. And it's like, mm -hmm. eh, that's got to, to me, I think about that. I'm like, 
boy, there's some people that might be really upset. And, and I'll, I'll, I will ask you about, you know, some of the comments yeah, and remarks because I know that. that's a thing too, mm -hmm. but the pressure to be right. Right. That is probably, and I think a lot of, you know, there's the, the old joke, which I'm going to be honest with you, is quite tiring uh, to hear it. But, you know, there's always the whole joke like, oh, it's the only job where you get to be, you know, wrong half the time and you, and um, it's okay. Yeah. It's okay. You still have a job. And I'm like, no, no that's not right. how this works. But, you know, you just have to kind of smile and nod uh, to most people when they say that. But, you know, I'll be raw and honest with you, like, and anyone who may be listening. It's, it's, uh, it's, we get it right way more than people give yeah. us credit for. And that's just because uh, the techniques and forecasting has gotten better. The technology is better. Our knowledge base is just beyond what it's, it was when I started in undergrad. I remember when I was an undergrad, we had computer models and computer data. And, you know, we, we learned a lot of great for forecasting techniques that uh, I learned was just one tenth of what I needed to know. And uh, you learn a lot on by experience on the job. Um, you know, the, the college and that'll get you the base. But, you know, from there you have to you have to keep learning. Uh, and we are very fortunate to live in a time where we have, you know, when I was in undergrad, we would just look at two or three different computer models. And now we literally have, you know, a hundred versions of one model. Like yeah. essentially we have, you know, more than we have exponentially increased the amount of weather information that we have available to us to make our forecast. But that hasn't lessened the pressure because now we are a victim of our own success because our forecasts are so good now that when you do get it wrong, people, especially people tend to forget the good part. They yeah. forget the positive. They forget that you were right for the last 10, 20, a hundred days but that one day, or you said we're going to get a blizzard and you end up getting a rainstorm. That is huge. So yeah. Yeah, the pressure's still on. Uh, we see it all the time. We saw it with, um, you know, with her hurricane, Harvey and and Maria and Sandy, we we see it with wildfires out in the West. Um, being able to predict fire weather is such a huge thing, especially now they're putting a bigger emphasis on it. But we see it with extreme weather. I mean, just from when we're recording this podcast, two days ago and yesterday, uh, Miami, Florida got almost two feet of rain. Nobody would have been able to predict that. Yeah. That's an extreme event that is not predictable. And not to mention the fact that like climate change and other things are impacting our weather and we're building more on the coast and along rivers where places where we shouldn't be building. So we are, we have faced the pressure of getting it right. We also face the pressure of communicating it clearly in a time where media is fragmented and where people don't always believe the experts for whatever reason, you know, that's more social science and beyond my purview. And also, um, you know the, the 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 extreme weather that continues to plague our our world between all these factors that are occurring like the pressure's never been more on so learning we also have to learn how to to predict the impacts too which is something yeah. i was never taught in in undergrad you know right. and maybe they're teaching that now but when i was undergrad it was you make a weather forecast and then you just give people the information and let them deal with it but now you have to think okay i'm going to make the weather forecast, but how is this going to impact people? Like that is yeah. super important now. And that's probably the same, even more so, you know, not just in meteorology, but in all sorts of, um, all sorts of fields, I would imagine like in, in marketing and, in and in, I mean, really in all Absolutely. fields, we yeah. have to think about impacts and, yep. um, cause and effect. Right. Oh, yes. It's and a then thing. of course, just a real quick, you know, aside, since I do work in media, we also have to think about other things too. We've got TV ratings. We've got how many oh, people see yeah. your tweets, yep. how many people read our website and, you know, your brand, you know, all those thing. things, all those things also play into it, which is stuff that I have to learn on the job. You know, I wasn't taught any of that stuff in, in undergrad too. So, you know, that's kind of all adds up, you know, in a and sense. So the pressure is really on for, for us in the, in the media. And it's funny you say that because I don't think anyone like, anyone else outside of a you know i mean they're teaching social media classes now and mm -hmm. in college and things like that and and meet how to be media savvy and things like that 
but anyone in a career outside of that, I don't know if they're getting like, you know, okay, this is who you are. This is what you want to do. You, you want to be a, you know, a graphic design, whatever, you know, you, you, right. you name it, you pick it, but factoring in a social media aspect of it, which is now mm-hmm. a thing, like people are taught, you, you got to brand right. yourself. You got to do this. You got to do that because there's a way to connect with others. And you might be in the situation where you need, you know, you know, you want to follow up and do this and that that's all part of it. Sure. Hardly anyone at, before Twitter became a big thing, realized that's a big part of it. And now it is. And people mm-hmm. are finding an interest mm-hmm. in doing it, but I don't think people realize yes. like for a, 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 for a weather, a, a meteorologist or a sportscaster or a news guy or, you know, a politician, you name it. Social media was never mm-hmm. something that was looked at in the forefront, but now you've got to use it in order to communicate with an audience and share right. what, what information you have that they might be interested in, especially sure. if it's life-saving in some cases. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. Um, it's funny. And it's a beast. You have to feed yes. it too. <laughs> yes. Because I, nine times out of 10, I, I know I've probably done it to you where it's like, will I be okay to go out for a run yeah, tomorrow yeah, at 3 yeah. p.m.? Is sure. What's it going to be like? And sure. I'm sure you get that all the time with people. Like, yeah. Memorial Day, what's it going to be like? Mm-hmm. I, I missed mm-hmm. the forecast and you tweet out links to it all the time, but someone still might just want to have it tweeted back at them immediately. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. And, it, and it, it's an on-demand customer service too. In yeah. 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 So, so it's, it's a thing. I, 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 I tiptoed into it. How do you manage... And on your personal level, uh-huh. dealing with the customer, dealing with the people, because you, you said it, you only hear about it when you're wrong. And right. typically that's when it comes down to, well, we didn't, we expected to get six inches of snow and we only got a dusting or we expected to right. get this ice storm and it, only, it was only freezing rain. You know, yeah. it's only when you're wrong and it's only typically in extreme cases, like no one's right. going to, going to complain to you and, you know, it's 75. You said it was only going to be 62. Right. Like, no one's no one going to remember that. Right. It's always yeah. the, the extreme aspects of mm-hmm. it. How? Because I know you probably have some stories and you don't have to get into them. But sure. I, I know some of the stuff I've gotten from just working in sports and people think mm-hmm. this is how it works. Nah, actually, that's not how it works. Just take a chill pill. And we'll no. do this. Yeah. I imagine in weather you've, you've got, you know, to sort of sometimes take a step back from the social media or from the email or from the phone call Mm -hmm. and just sort of do the job at hand and still, you know, (laughs) not let the person get to you. Cause I I know that's a thing, but how on earth do you manage it? Patience, I'm guessing, um, right? (laughs) Right. And it is, it's something that you are constantly managing. Um, You know, I've been very fortunate since I got to DC. I haven't gotten a lot of, negative feedback. Um, but I would say, especially early on in your career and when you're first getting into a new place, a new market, uh, you know, a new job, you're going to get feedback. And, uh, oftentimes it'll be unwanted and Mm -hmm. unnecessary. Um, I think for weather, especially we've, um, we put ourselves out there. We're predicting the future, which there aren't many jobs that do. And so, we have to know that people are paying attention and they're going to say, oftentimes they're not going to say it with class. They're going to say it, you know, very rude or mean things to you, um, swear at you and whatever. Um, I would say that, um, it, it does hurt. And I think especially when you first get into this, you, I mean, you realize that you just have to have, you have to learn how to thicken up your skin just a bit and be able to turn the other cheek, which is, I think is a good way to live life anyway. But like, um, yeah, I've had to deal with it. Uh, once you get trusted in the market per se, or whatever your, you know, your audience is, um, things get better and you tend to not get as much flack about it. Um, but there's also some people who will always, who are just always going to give you, you know, negative feedback that mm-hmm. just doesn't do it. You know, they just want to vent. They want someone to vent to in a sense. And so, you know, thankfully now with online tools, it's easy to mute people, yeah. or block people, which, you know, I try not to block people, especially on Twitter. I just kind of mute them um, or just ignore, you know, just kind of move on and ignore. It's better to not engage if you don't have to, yep. unless your boss is like, you need to engage with that person. But oftentimes they're, they won't, and um, I've gotten pretty good, pretty good about 
not engaging uh, with with negative feedback. Or if somebody says, you know, hey, I thought it was going to do this. You know, I tried to explain to them, hey, well, you know, the storm went to the north or it didn't rain where you are, but it did rain in, right. in Chesterfield or it rained in Alton, you know. But, it, you know, the forecast was for an, a 150 mile square right. area you know that's it's not just your location or you know we try to explain and some people are thankful for that some people will just you know move on and they'll forget about it and you will too and eventually you go to bed and you wake up the next day and that that day's done and you just kind of move on from it um but yeah and i you know i can't i can't speak for women either because i feel like it's it's much oh, tougher yeah. for women in yeah. in media uh, per probably in 99% of fields, but certainly in media and in my field, meteorology, where there are fewer women in my field than men, even to this day, um, I think it's even tougher for them because the bar is set higher for some, you know, for reasons that are beyond this podcast. Yeah. <laughs> talk to the social scientists about, but basically they're, they're not treated as, as being as intelligent often as men are, even though they are often just as or more intelligent yeah. and uh, their abilities are always questioned. And of course they're based, you know, things they're based on how they look, which happens to men too, but far more to women. And then not to mention the sexual harassment that happens all the time on social media yeah. and all the time by email, like people email TV stations. I've seen some really, really unfortunate and just disgusting emails sent to my female colleagues, colleagues, male and female, mostly female. And I'm just like, why really? like, yeah. would you ever like possess you to do that? So, you know, I can't speak for them. I just know that it is even more difficult. So then when they get flack for a missed forecast, et cetera, like that, you know, I see it all the time with Ginger Z actually on ABC because I follow her on Twitter. People say, well, she doesn't even know what she's talking about. I'm like, she has a bachelor's degree in meteorology and she has lots of experience. So yeah, she knows what she's talking about. You armchair meteorologists on Twitter, like you don't, how yeah. do you, you don't know anything like compared to her in, in this field. She's the expert. You're not. So I see it all the time. She's good about responding to them, but I'm sure it's hurtful and it's tough. And you could be the best meteorologist in the world and you're still going to get people yeah. to give you crap. And you feel bad when you get it wrong. You really do. Like, there were there are some days in St. Louis where it, the weather kicks your butt, and you're like, <laughs> "Oh my god!" Like, what a terrible forecast, you know? People, some people, some people will they'll let you hear it too, yeah. you know? And they can't wait to let you hear it too. It's yeah. kind of like yeah, some are like they're that. ready to pounce. They, yeah, yeah, they are. And on, the, on that same sort of line of thinking, when the tornado warning happens, when it's a true uh -huh. safety issue, and you uh -huh. have to interrupt programming, and there are people that just you know, they are angry and they don't care and they're yes. watching their favorite show, but right. you really are in a life-saving, mm -hmm. you know, point in time. I mean, there are, I think it's, it's unique and I don't know for DC, like, I don't, I don't know what the coverage area is there for your station, but like in St. Louis, when it's a wider area across the river mm -hmm. and the storms march from east to west, um, or west to east, sorry. And right. you want to keep people informed and tell people, hey, you've got to take cover. And mm -hmm. the people that may have already had the storm pass by or they're not in the path of it and they're still, you know, they can't watch what they want to watch. The lack of understanding there. Sure. Um, it's still something I feel society struggles with and i, I right. don't know why because we've we've overcome it where we've got online tools now you guys typically will replay shows if they mm -hmm. miss them and we can't just give an exception for a crazy severe storm that's coming through to save people's lives yeah does, does that hold anything to you where it's kind of like I'm, I'm doing a job but i'm also trying to save people's lives here at the same point and then you get the random two or three people the the, the vocal minority as they say right. they really are want to they speak are a minority mm -hmm. yeah um, yeah um yeah i can think of a couple instances instances one i was involved in when i wasn't um because i remember years back when i had to interrupt this is when i was working with cindy pressler our former mm -hmm. chief meteorologist uh, who's now living the good life in florida <laughs> <laughs> she, um, she and i had to work and we covered up um some of i think it was i forget which one of the the triple crown races where we had to deal with that where we had to do but you know as an nbc affiliate in st yeah. louis ksdk uh, they run all those horse races and so 
we had to cover up a lot of the coverage except for the race itself. Like we dumped out, let the race happen and then went back on air. But we had a tornado coming into Southern Illinois and going into a town where, you know, thousands of people lived there and could have died. Um, the tornado was confirmed. It was there and it was, could have been deadly, uh, destroyed houses, impacted people's lives. And I remember getting a lot of people, you know, who are, who just don't normally watch anyway, but since they want to watch the horse race, which I get it, I like sports. They were very upset that we were, you know, cover, covering up a lot of the horse racing coverage. And uh, we got a lot of flack for that, emails and tweets and, you know, et cetera. And uh, I, have, I remember one guy even brought it up like four or five years later oh, geez. on Twitter. And I was like, dude, like, <laughs> let it go. I mean, like, you need to move on. Like, honestly, I felt bad that day. But at the same time, it's just like, I'm sorry. Like, that's just what our, our job is to do that. Our job yeah. is to broadcast this information to people, to get the message from the National Web Service to people. And people just automatically assume, well, you know, we've got smartphones. We've got this. Like, there's so, so many ways to get technology. I'm like, you know what? Not everyone has a smartphone. Has a, yep. We're not all, we can't all afford an iPhone or an Android. Like you have to really think beyond your world, your world. You yeah. may be very fortunate. You have all those nice things, a laptop, fat, high speed internet. Not everybody has that. Where I think we're seeing that now, even in the middle of this pandemic, like I don't know how it is in St. Louis. It probably is the case with, you know, DC public schools and even some of the suburban schools, the good schools, quote unquote, they're having problems with their technology because they're trying to teach remotely. Yep. Not everyone has high speed internet or if they do, it doesn't always work. Not everyone has a laptop or uh, an iPhone or a smart device that they can use. Or sometimes they're limited because there's three kids in the house and only one can be online at the same time for a variety of reasons. We're learning. I think that some people are learning now. It's like, we don't all live the same. Right. This is a country with a diverse amount of backgrounds and incomes and you know, back, you know, all sorts of things, and we don't all live the same. So going back to what I was saying about cutting in for tornadoes, we're still going to do that. That's still going to happen in D.C., in St. Louis, in every market. We're still going to interrupt programming because not everyone has access to that. And you could lose access to that yeah. stuff in a terrible storm. A windstorm could knock out your internet very easily, yep. you know, especially if you live in a away from a city in more rural areas where high speed internet is too expensive or not available or right. not dependable. Um, so this is still a medium. We see it all the time when the ratings go up when we have severe weather and we're not making extra money off of that because we can't run ads during severe weather because it's a tornado warning, you know? Right. So it's not like we're doing it for ratings. It doesn't do any good for us to, to interrupt in a sense, like ratings wise, we do it because it's part of our public service in a sense. Like we're television programs, yes, and we need to make money, yes, that is important. But at the same time, it's like we also have a public service aspect to what we do. But I don't feel bad for doing it. Um, I don't appreciate the negative feedback, but you just kind of you kind of have to deal with it. And I think most people understand that. Right. So I certainly, and you know, if people who don't understand that, I just can't. You know, I I can't relate to that, and I just can't speak you know, to their worldview. And, you know, I'll just leave it at that. That's their worldview and let them have that worldview if they want. If they want to understand ours, we can, I'll explain it easily. Um, and I just want to mention as a side, I remember, you know, we had these tornadoes in Nashville recently mm -hmm. that killed people. Yes. And all of the affiliates had negative feedback from people. Um, not a lot of negative feedback, but a vocal minority were upset that they were interrupting programming, you know, it might've been like the bachelor, you know, it's one of those shows that like yeah. a lot of people <laughs> really want to watch live for, you know, it, it is what it is, but like multiple uh, across all the network affiliates in Nashville, my company doesn't own any stations in Nashville, but they had um, some feedback, you know, and there was a vocal minority people who were upset. People literally died in I, those tornadoes yeah. and they still did not care. It hit a major population. One tornado went right through the north part of the city near downtown. One of the TV stations had to evacuate. That's how bad it was. I mean, had to um, take shelter during the tornado. And they still don't. Like, to me, it's like if you, I mean, unless it's literally raining down on their house, they do not care. And there's just, unfortunately, there's going to be a vocal minority of people who 
are just they just the way they live. They, yeah. if, if it doesn't impact me, I don't care. And I'm like, well, that's not how the world works, unfortunately. You know, right, right. Especially in this so, world, we, we do have the technology. And mm-hmm. hey, if you're that angry about your, you know, not being able to watch this program, you can change the channel and come right. back. Like it's okay. Yeah. Like just scream it or you know come back to it. <laughs> and I, like you said, oftentimes TV stations will rerun yeah. program you know, where we've had to interrupt and we're glad to do that. You know, I mean, our job is to provide entertainment. Yes. But in, in 2020, there are other ways to be entertained temporarily. It's just, a right. you know, it's such a minor inconvenience too. Yeah. That's what is interesting to me. We provide you this service for free. Like I can put in 10 on my TV, watch any channel over right. the air and it costs nothing, nothing. beyond an antenna and the electricity <laughs> to run my TV and they get upset because we interrupted their show. That's really, and to me, that was really interesting. Like, I, yeah. you know, I think social media has made people, um, it's done a lot of good, but it's also done a lot of interesting and not necessarily good things. It gives voice to people, which is great. But sometimes it gives voice to things that aren't really generally reasonable right at the same time too, so yeah and, and, for, and i won't go any further from there no you're, you're good because I, I was just going to tell for folks that may not know you or the background which a lot of the folks that i talk to in this podcast uh, i'm introducing people to another set of people that mm-hmm. you're pretty active on twitter and i will share your your twitter handle in my sh- uh, podcast notes and online and it'll be tweeted and everything like that but you're pretty active so you see it you're mm-hmm. you're there all the time like you were sharing you, you t- sure. told me today today's your day off and you were still tweeting weather stuff related yeah, to, yeah. to dc yeah. so you're you you see this stuff all the time so um before i let you go i gotta ask because of the state of where sure. we all are now um you're the first person I've talked to that's been a TV uh, uh, person and with the state of the pandemic and how things have sort of shifted our lives, everything's been shifted one way or another, depend on what line of career you're in or things like that. Um, right. With, with news, we've had anchors at home. We've mm-hmm. seen them social, social distance in the studio. And yes. here in St. Louis, we've had just Mike Bush in the studio and Ann Allerit right. at home. Um, you know, right. our, our anchors are people. They are people too. Some of them right. have health conditions. Mm-hmm. There are some can be older, some mm-hmm. are younger. So they're doing the same thing mm-hmm. and being good models for us. For you, I see you've got your TV uh, uh, station logo backdrop behind you. And yeah, everything. I've got a back backdrop. Yeah, <laughs> doing doing the forecast from home the last few weeks. How has it been for you and and managing this? And what do you think? Are you guys? What's the state of, of things in DC? Are you guys, you know, under a quarantine still? Lifting yeah. orders, phases. Mm-hmm. What's all that like been for you? So we, um, you know, I'm in a unique situation, in that DC is one of the the last um, spots in America that has, unfortunately, has had still a large amount of coronavirus okay. cases. And you know, I, I can't predict what's going to happen in the future. You know, that's what other experts are for. Right. So I listen to them. But um, so with that said, um, D.C. and many of the surrounding metro area counties here still are stay at home, shelter in place, older orders, basically, you know, some form of that. While our respective states, Maryland and Virginia, uh, in this part of the country are starting to uh, do phased reopenings, as okay. many places are across the country. So for a lot of the television stations here and certainly for where i work here um my company tegna which also owns kstk Mm -hmm. in st louis so you know i've just i work for the same company as those folks just different place so we have a a company policy that covers where we work you know how the stay-at-home stuff is going to work and then individual markets are are doing different slightly different things but a majority of my coworkers, including me are definitely working from home uh, I've been working from home since mid-March, so it's been a couple months now, and I, okay, I'm i only guessing that it's going to go into June for me, at least personally, before uh, I do return to the studio. Now, I have been to work a couple times. Um, when we were in the midst of severe weather, it's just a little bit easier to do my job sure. with the tools there and be able to talk to the producers and behind-the-scenes folks, but... 98% of my shifts have been at home. So I've been working from this little corner in my apartment. <laughs> um, and I do have like a little background set. I've got a camera, which you, you can't see Derek, but it's on the other side of this computer. Okay. Um, 
dual monitors. Um, and I'm able to access almost everything I need from here. And I can do it safely with my family, which is really great. Um, I get a window view, which I don't typically, you typically don't have in TV studios. So that's kind of nice. Um, so it's been good. Um, there's obviously pluses and minuses to it. I feel like, especially for broadcasters, I think things can be a little bit more dynamic. There's more energy when you get to collaborate in person with sure. your, your coworkers. So I do miss that energy of having other people in the studio, my producers, our production staff, and be able to walk down the hallway and say, hey, what do you think of this? Or, hey, there's a tornado raining down upon us. We need to go on TV. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a different dynamic. Um, and I know eventually we'll get back to that dynamic. I can't see this being a permanent thing, but I do see a lot more of this in our industry happening. Um, I think a lot more of my coworkers will be based more remote and we'll just check in to the TV station maybe once a week or periodically while a lot of the uh, folks like me, the news anchors and some of the production staff will continue to work at, at the TV station. So uh, it's, it's a unique time um, again and uh, DC being kind of a, a coronavirus hotspot, you know, it's not, not my favorite term for it, but basically a place where there are still a lot of cases. Sure. Yep. We still have to, be very cautious yeah. here where where we are for sure being vigilant is is important mm -hmm. uh, i think that's one thing that we we all want to return to normal and yeah and, and and do things as we we had previously before march and all, all the shutdowns happened but being smart and vigilant is very important we definitely want to re reiterate that so mm -hmm. um, this has been fun, man. I I, I didn't know cool. we'd take this deep of a dive and, and, and jump good. into it, but this is great. Yeah, I, this and, is, and all the things you need to edit out, you know, get them off. <laughs> no, no, this is great. I I appreciate it because it's definitely something I, I could tell you I've always been interested in. I I could I can remember some summer uh, in between school years of turning on the Weather Channel and mm -hmm. seeing it when I wanted to see it before we had so much local right. news on. You before just the, on internet, the Weather Channel, yeah. they do mm -hmm. the locals on the sevens every Local, twenty seven yeah, and fifty seven. Yeah, well. <laughs> I totally remember that. They and then they pop in a local map. And you can see what's going on. It's like, all yep. right, we can go outside and play catch because it's not exactly. going to rain. <laughs> yeah, and we're we're so spoiled now because we get weather information from so many places yeah. now too. So I guess that's the, the other thing about my industry is that since you can get weather information so easily, you have to like find unique ways of presenting it now to you know letting how people get impacted, etc. So uh, yeah, we've come a long way in this industry for sure. Definitely, definitely. Well, I appreciate you taking time for, for talking with me. This has been fun. Uh, hopefully some Thanks. people will find some interest and some information that they may not have known about mm -hmm. what you do and what other meteorologists do across the country and how they help uh, protect citizens across the country in times of bad weather and uh, just shed a little bit more light of what you guys do and how you uh, do it so well. So I appreciate yeah. you taking time for talking with me. Yeah, no worries. And if anyone ever wants to reach out to me about meteorology, careers and stuff i'm i'm always open to help as best i can you know within the ability of my time so <laughs> <laughs> definitely appreciate it